Hi guys, welcome to the Isaac series. Uh, it's amazing to be back here with you guys. Um, you see, um, at such a time as this, we do not have a choice on whether we do social media. The question is how well we do social media. So today we'll be talking about um, social media and how it is transforming our lives, how it is transforming our businesses, you know, how it is transforming every in fact it is leaving every single industry mm -hmm. radically transformed than uh, we actually met it you know social social media is something um a company an individual can almost not do without if you want to thrive in today's world you know um so welcome again to the isaac series um today our guest is um an amazing human being um eric corman you know um so today we basically welcome a leading authority on digital transformation. Um, Eric Coleman is a best-selling author. Um, he's an author of several powerful books. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, hi, Eric. Okay, Eric. Eric is here already. So let's let me bring him right in. Um, waving right back. Welcome, guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, so let me just bring Eric right in, right in. Uh, all right, so we're waiting for Eric to come in. Wow. <laughs> hey, man. Hi, Eric. Hey, good to see you, Isaac. How are things? Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you so much for doing this. No, thank you. Thanks for all the support over the years. I appreciate it. It's great to join your community here. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for the incredible, incredible work that you do. Um, it's so amazing to have you here. Um, our Nigerian audience, uh, they are so hyped, you know, um, to come join and, uh, I mean, learn from your well of wisdom. Um, so basically, um, I'll just quickly go through your very brief profile, you know, to give um, um, the audience an understanding of... Um, who you are, especially those who are just hearing about you for the first time. Yeah, so Eric is a best-selling author of um, several times over and an acclaimed keynote speaker that has spoken in over 55 countries and reached over 50 million people. Wow. A five-time best-selling author and keynote speaker um, is the number one best-selling author of um, five books on digital leadership, including Socionomics, which is um, held in over a thousand libraries globally and was voted the second most likable author in the world alongside our reporters jk rowling and seth godin is the host of the popular super you podcasts and um, his work has been used by the national guard to uh, nbc universal to nasa amazing so welcome once again eric great to have you here oh great to be here where are you where are you where are you today where are you sitting today Okay, well, um, live from um, Lagos, Nigeria. Nice. Beautiful. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Okay, so you've been rated um, um, second, the second most likable author in the world. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm especially excited to have you here with us. So tell us about starting out as an author, you know, especially uh, the journey to starting out and uh, to getting to where you are today, basically. Just take us through it uh, very briefly. Yeah, no, very briefly, and thank you for reading Socialnomics, but my whole history has been in the digital side of business. So I worked at Yahoo back when they were kind of the Facebook or the TikTok of the day. And then before yeah. writing Socialnomics, I uh, was the head of marketing at Travel Zoo. And so I saw an opportunity to where social media wasn't just for teenagers, that it would change the way we communicate and for business. And so that's yeah. why I wrote Socialnomics. And that was the first book. And then from there, now the last 11 years, I write books. I speak on stage. I've been to 55 countries. We've reached 50 million people. Uh, but we're wow. trying to reach 7 billion people by 2030. So uh, can't do it without <laughs> people like you. So thanks for all the support. And it's been a wild ride, that's for sure. Amazing, amazing. Okay, so 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 um, your, your book Socionomics is filled with. Um, I read it about five years ago, and truthfully, it actually opened my eyes to the possibilities, the opportunities um, that social actually brings. You know, today, I I I, I mean, I've been able to create one of the most visited uh, sites in Nigeria, uh, news sites in Nigeria. It's called TopNiger.ng. Nice, um, that's it's a huge. Very popular. Congrats. Yeah, 
it's a very popular YouTube website. And of course, Socialomics was one of those books that opened my eyes to the to what was coming, basically, you know. Yeah, so um, the book practically foretold the realities we live in today, you know. Um, and then at times, I, I, I mean, I'm almost tempted to to think that you are probably a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because of the aptness, you know, um, that that book came with, yeah. So, but then, how do you come about those precise statistics? How, how did you find out? How did you know that things were going to be the way they are right now across um, the social media space, Twitter, Facebook, and the likes? And how did you, how, how come you were so precise as to exactly what was going to be happening today um, and how social media was going to disrupt businesses, you know, how we, how we live, how we love, how we work, and all of that? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. The key that all of us need to remember in this day and age, and even looking back 10, 11 years, is that technology changes every second, but human mm. nature never does. So when you're trying to figure out where we're going to go, you almost do more, less technology and more anthropology, the study of human beings. And I'll always say I can't predict what tool will win, because if I did, I'd have like an amazing jet right behind me, ready right, to take me anywhere. I'd have a, jet, a couple jets behind me. But what you can see is trends. So what does that mean? That means that 20 years ago, you could see that search was going to be huge, but we didn't know. And I sat at Yahoo at the time, and actually a little company called Google helped backpower Yahoo. And Yahoo yeah. decided not to buy Google. They could have bought them for a million dollars. They could have bought Google for a million dollars. But the reason I tell that story is that we know search was going to be big, but we didn't know if Dogpile, Ask, Lycos, Yahoo, you know, or Google was going to win. Ask Jeeves, name it. And then today we don't know who's going to be the ultimate winner. Is it going to be Instagram, TikTok, um, Facebook? But we do know that social is here to stay because we're just social animals. And so you always got to look at what are people – I love doing this. Whenever you, And it's hard to fly right now like because of quarantine. But normally the best yeah. way to get a pulse on what people are doing is when you walk through an international airport, there's people from all over the world. And I kind of look, what are they using? And so that gives me some insight into the human behavior. And I go, okay, they're using this. History repeats itself. So we can kind of see that's where it's probably going to go. So I'm always a big fan of looking at the human side first and then looking at the technology that's going to make life easier for all of us amazing amazing that's that's pretty insightful amazing okay so 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 from your proven experience so far you've written five best-selling books what's the key to writing a bestseller the key to writing a bestseller is to write i know that sounds weird but people always ask you how do you write a book and i go you gotta write and i know that i always like to simplify things down because it's just like you want to write right you want to speak get out there and speak and so you don't need a phd to write a book and like for this is a good example, because even today I have kind of an imposter syndrome. All of us think, why me? Why would I be the one that can do this? And actually, even though I've been doing this for a while, for this new book, The Focus Project, I wrote a poem and have it at the front of the book. And I sit there and go, why would I write a poem? I'm not a poet. But guess what? Walt Whitman was a poet before they wrote their first poem. So everyone starts mm -hmm. at the same place. Yeah. And so it's really yeah. – and so you ask me, how do you write a book? Just get out there and do it. Everyone – has a different recipe on how they write a book. Now, at first, the way I used to do it is I go, I got to write 500 words. I got to write 500 words a day, and that's how I get a book out there. But that didn't work well for me because some days I just didn't have 500 words. And so now instead what I do is I just go, okay, I'm going to write for a half hour. Okay. A half hour. Now, some days I'll write for three hours, but it's just like staying in that process. And some days I'll write a lot that won't be used. Other days I'll write like one sentence. I just don't have it, but I'm just in the thought process for 30 minutes. And then there's other days in 30 minutes I can write 3,000 really good words. And so I found that that process works the best for me. Other writers, they might go away to the woods for three weeks and rock it out yeah. for three weeks. So it all depends on what's in your DNA. But uh, the short answer is if you want to write a book, write. If you want to write a screenplay, right. play, write. If you want to speak publicly, go out there and speak. You know, so it's just like if you want to play an instrument, start playing the guitar, you know, play every day. So that's, yeah. that's, it's as simple as that. That's very simple, very simple. But then um, um, a whole lot of people actually write, you know, um, I like to put it this way. They are writers and they are star writers. They are authors and they are star authors. 
So what makes the difference between um, an author and a star author like you? Yeah. I think it's stories. So even though most of my books are business books, you still have to write them in stories. That's how humans like to communicate. So always ask yourself kind of what's the situation? What's the action? What's the result? Um, or the so what? Now, taking a big step back, whenever you write a book, there's two reasons to write a book. Change the world or change yourself. So either change yourself or change the world. You shouldn't write a book to make money, okay? Because then it's, it's just not going to work. Like, you should write it because you know you need to get it out of there. And, like, audience of one, that you're kind of almost writing it for yourself. Almost every book I write, I go, well, I have a need for this book, and it's not out there. So I'm going to write it. I'm going to reference this new book. Like, I needed help with focus. And yeah. so then I wrote it for one. But the more I talk to people, I realize everyone kind of wrestles with focus, which is good. Yeah. But at yeah. the end of the day, you write the book, and if – only you read it, that's okay. You know, it's fine. Amazing. You got it done. Amazing, amazing. So that also helps you to see the, um, I mean, what people are in need of by time, you know, a ready market, you know, ready audience for your book, you know, before the book is out. Amazing, yeah, and amazing. When, when you want to, so to help sell the book, so this is someone, a, a really big time author told me this when I was young. Yeah. It didn't really make sense when he told me it. Then uh, now I know what he was saying. He goes, hey, how's the book coming? And I go, good, I've done. I, I've written it. I've edited it. I've just handed it off to the publisher. Now we're just going to print it. And he kind of yeah. looks at me and goes, he goes, good, you're 50% done. <laughs> Meaning that the other 50% is you got to sell the book. And so, mm -hmm. if you, so that's, that's the process is that a lot of us think whether you're a writer or whether you Whatever you do, whatever your talent is, you run yeah. a company. It's like yeah. you think that, and I thought this way for a long time. Oh, my job is just to do the work, meaning I just produce the book or I produce yeah. the song. But yeah. then I realized, wait, no, my job is actually to also sell the work. Absolutely. And so that's Absolutely. for a lot of creative folks. That's kind of an, for me, it was, it's eye opening. They're like, oh, okay, got it. The work's only 50% of it. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so each time you're done, um, you have five bestsellers right now, right? Each time you're done um, writing your books, what's the process that goes into ensuring that they become bestsellers? Yeah. Just like you also told you that you, you, you're just done um, with 50% of the work. So the other 50% that has to do with selling, what's the key ingredients to making a success of that? The key ingredient is the content. So it goes back to that 50% because if, if it's not good in this digital era with online ratings on an Amazon, that's, it's going to be word of mouth on digital steroids. So ironically, it's my first book, Socialnomics. All that term means is word of mouth on digital steroids or word of mouth is now world of mouth is that the content has to be good first. Then from there, you've got to kind of hand it out to as many people as possible. And what plays into that is luck, but you can increase your luck percentage by distributing yeah. it, doing stuff like we're doing here, talking about it. And then if the right person at the right time picks it up, then it can, it can take off. Um, and so a lot of it has to do with influencers, but then also the content itself. And then that's where you start to get the momentum. Okay. Beyond that, are there, are there any, um, precise marketing efforts that you also put into it to ensure that the right people get to talk about it at the right time? You know, some will argue with me. My thing's always been hand-to-hand -hand combat. So if we have a mailing list of 30,000, I never like to just blast 30,000 people. We'll actually send it through my Gmail account so that if they reply, it comes back to me and I interact with them. So it's kind of super old school. It's not very scalable, but I've always found that that hand-to-hand -hand combat that the key to any successful launch, whether it's a book, whether it's a product or service, is you've got to have those 1,000, or it depends on your scale. It might just be 100. But it's really those fans that no matter what you produce, they're going to want it. So you don't want to be in the middle, meaning you have 1,000 fans that love everything you do. And then you yeah. have a bunch of people that hate what you do. That's fine. That's better. That's better than being in the middle. Being in the middle where it's like, ah, maybe I'll get it. Oh, he doesn't bother me that much. You don't want to be in the middle. You want to kind of have those, those, core, those core fans. Mm. 
Okay, awesome, awesome. So now that we're here, what, what's going to be? What, what's going to be? Um, I mean, you're more or less like a, I mean, a futurist and a, a, a very successful at that. So, what's going to be our digital reality in the next five years, and, and how can businesses and people position for influence? It's interesting because I've been talking about digital leadership now for eight years, obviously socialnomics for 11, but digital leadership, we're saying, hey, transformation's coming. We're in our car. Here comes the transformation wall. Let's transform. Let's get ready. And yeah. all of a sudden, global yeah. pandemic, global pandemic happens. So now it's like, boom. Mm. Now we don't have a choice on whether we digitally transform. The choice is on how well we do it. So Absolutely. what does that mean? What's the world look like? I mean, someone asked me this question the other day, actually, for South by Southwest, is, which is coming up next year, a big conference. What's the biggest trend I'm going to see? I think the biggest trend, obviously, we already seeing people are going to be work, working virtually. Um, that's not going to go away. There's a yeah, lot absolutely. of changes. More, more online ordering, obviously, because why would I, if I can get a package from Amazon at my doorstep in a day, why would I even bother going out to get anything else? So those are stuff you can readily already see. I think the next step is that combination of artificial intelligence plus voice search. So think mm -hmm. Google Home or Alexa, and you just say, Alexa, please reorder my groceries, and please look for any coupons to apply against that order, and please have them shipped here within the next hour. And so it's simple as that. Yeah. It's like... And even then, and then Alexa will come back because she's combining both the things. She'll come back and say, actually, I'm not going to reorder the eggs because I can actually see in your refrigerator that you already have enough eggs. Mm. And so that's the combination we're looking for. Mm. That's um, intuition and um, amazing and artificial intelligence. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, so, so basically, of course, I mean, there's a lot of disruption going on right now, uh, just in addition to what you just said. Um, how can an average individual leverage uh, digital right now to create wealth, especially in Africa, based on, based on your experience? Yeah, the, the best way is always ask yourself, and I just gave a commencement address, a digital one, to a bunch of graduates, and I said, your goal in life shouldn't be to be successful. And so you can imagine all the parents and like the chancellor <laughs> of the university is like, oh, what? We got this not guy. <laughs> so I'm like, your goal in life is not to be successful. Your goal in life is to be valuable. And when your goal is to be valuable, success will certainly follow. So if you provide that value. So if you're in Africa, a couple things. First, right now you should be asking, how do I provide value? So it's not like, how do I make money? It's how do I provide value? When you provide value, that money will come. And so it's like, how do I provide value? Also, whenever you find yourself frustrated or upset, complain for like 60 seconds, get it off your chest, and then realize either I'm going to come up with a solution or I'm going to stop complaining. Because obviously I'm not the only one dealing with this. And so there's there's... There's easy industries to see that are ripe for disruption. So when you think about taxi cabs, no one was upset that the taxi went away except for taxi cab drivers and taxi companies. Like if, if you were to pull people before Uber came along, they, they wouldn't be able to tell you, hey, I need someone that I don't know to pick me up in their car. Yeah. yeah. But they would be able to tell you, I hate getting in a taxi cab. And Absolutely. so what is what industry right now does that look like? There's a couple. Airline industry. No one says mm -hmm. I love my airline. So that's ripe for disruption. And so we'll see if that changes during the pandemic, if some of these folks go out of business, and then we see a new yeah. way to travel. Um, ho hotels, when you think about checking into your hotel. Yeah. No one loves the process of checking into your hotel. Or at Las Vegas, every time I go to – I'm not traveling right now, but I used to go to Vegas to speak a lot because there's huge conferences there. When I show yeah. up, there's a 30 minute line. I always laugh and go, are they surprised there's people coming to Vegas? Why is there a line here to check into the hotel? <laughs> and so in Africa, the question is, is there something that's frustrating for you? And if it is, start asking around. And if you start getting consensus with people that that's frustrating, then figure out that's something you can fix. 
Uh, but it's always with the question of how do I provide value? Mm. Awesome, 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 awesome. Now, let, let's talk about low points because uh, many tend to think that um, successful people always have it going great for them. You know, tell, tell us about um, one of the toughest situations you found yourself, you know, in business and as an author in general. Yeah, I mean, I would say, geez, when we first started out, uh, because I used to work at companies. And I, like I said, I was the head of marketing at Travel Zoo. We took that company, it was private, then we took it public. It did really well on the NASDAQ. Which company was that? It's called uh, Travel Zoo, and the, the stock trading symbol is T-Z-O-O. And so okay. uh, basically you can get a weekly top 20 list for free. So we have there's over like 30 million users that get a weekly newsletter for free that says here's the top amazing travel deals and that stock went like this like this like that like that so that was a wild ride but when i decided to kind of socialnomics took off the book so i started speaking and i realized wait this could be a full-time thing that i do i didn't do it right away so that's a big misconception a lot of talking heads out there to a lot of thought leaders, they kind of give you a hot take and say, if you're an entrepreneur, you never go to school. If you're an entrepreneur, you never go to college. If you're an entrepreneur, you never work for a company. That's not true. Yeah. Everyone has their different path. And I could go down the list, like the kids that started Warby Parker, they went to Wharton graduate school, didn't start it right away. They kind of did it half time. They did it as a side hustle. Um, Absolutely. So long story longer, when we started, when I started doing my own thing, it was the worst possible time because I'm like, all right, I'm going to do my own thing. And then all of a sudden I was part of this. We lost basically all of our savings and I won't get into the details, but lost all the money that we were supposed to use for this. And then I had a diagnosis, which fortunately after a year of blood tests, diagnosis for lymphoma. But this is at that moment as well. And then we're having our first child. So I'm like, how do we get health care for the baby? Wow. We lost all this money. Uh, but I always say that story because the best time once you're ready to start your company was yesterday. But the mm-hmm. second best time is today. No matter what's happening, it could be a pandemic. It could be the story that I just told you. Oh, also, it was yeah. during the Great Recession. It was during 2009. So it couldn't have been on paper the worst time to start our company, but we forged ahead. So those were some stressful days uh, doing that. And there's always self-doubt, even to this day, there's always self-doubt. Before you go on stage, you go, wait, there's like three CEOs who just spoke in front of me. Why am I speaking here? And so you've got to just know that at your core, you have an expertise and just Go with your passion and do your best. Forget the rest. That's all I say. Do your best. Forget the rest. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, let's talk about socionomics. Uh, it was a book, like I said. I mean, uh, it's one of the books I, I definitely, absolutely will never forget um, in terms of the impact on me, right? So um, tell us about the experience. It was your first book, right? Uh, how, how, how did you feel when it took off? What, I mean, and then what, what really happened? What, what, what were the events? Um and how did it change your life, basically? Yeah. Yeah, no, so it was, it was crazy. So I'd written a fiction book that had tons of rejection letters. So when my friend, I was given a lot of talks for free. I was the head of marketing at Travels. I was speaking at like search engine conferences. And everyone there is speaking on search, which makes sense. Because yeah. social media is just for teenagers. And I started saying, well, actually, let me yeah. talk about social media. And so everyone starts leaving the room and the audience size gets smaller. Then my buddy came up to me and said, Hey, I think a lot of people think you're crazy talking about social media for business, but once you talk to my publisher, I think you should write a book about it. So then we write the book. It doesn't go right away to number one. And so the publisher told me, Hey, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And then I decided to do a video for the book book to help me on stage just a two-minute video and in the back of my mind I go I want to give it a chance to go viral but no one has a recipe for making things go viral but I go if I put the audience first instead of my book first and my name first let's not even put my name in there we can avoid it 
Let's yeah. just provide value, getting back to the value. And mm. it's not easy to do at the time because the publisher said, well, why is this video? This video's not going to sell any books. It doesn't talk about the book. And I go, well, that's the point. It's about value. Like it talks about why social media is important. Mm. And so long, long story longer, that video went massively viral. And then that really helped the book. And then when I got on stage, I didn't even know you could speak for a living being on stage. And I actually still have an issue with uh, mumbling. So <laughs> my interpersonal communication skills, my friends always used to make fun of me. Um, and one of, my, one of my classmates from the University of Texas where I, for grad school even said the other day, if there was one person that I thought would be a public speaker, you would be the last on the list from, <laughs> from, our, from our college. And I took that as actually a compliment because I had taken Toastmasters classes. When I was at Travel Zoo, the CEO and founder is German, so I had to speak to the press a little more than normal, to Wall Street a little more than you normally would. Because uh, wow. his native language is German, not English. And so things yeah. happen for you. So all of it was a perfect storm in a good way. And so mm -hmm. all of a sudden someone comes up to me and goes, I don't know what you do for a living, but you should really speak for a living. You should, and I go, you can do that for a living. And they said, yeah, you can do that on stage for a living. So, and away we go. And then the video goes viral. So now we have an animation studio. That's why I'm wearing the studio hat, the animation hat for equal man studios. We've got an amazing team here. Uh, but yeah, if you'd have told me 11 years ago that this is, we'd be talking across the yeah. Atlantic ocean this way yeah. and say what are you talking about so this is amazing it's so awesome to join you here and uh you made it happen by reading the book and being such a fan so thank you thank you thank you for writing the book thank you so much um yeah so i see you have a new book in the works um i mean new book brand new uh the focus project i and see i'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you a quick question though because i'm just gonna turn the tables on you real quick if you don't mind okay, that's fine. So social nomics, you said it impacted and changed your life. How did it? How did it change your life? How did it impact? You? Well, I mean, in in diverse ways, actually. So, um, um, at a point when I read social nomics, um, I was, um, I was an employee at a fantastic organization called Desa. It's actually a mega. It's a it's a global um, non-profit organization, religious organization. Um, so I was leading the Desa team at Daystar uh, Christian Center. Um, um, I don't know if you know this, the, the senior pastor is um, Sam Adeyemi. He's a very popular, a profound uh, man, basically. So uh, I was leading the, the uh, uh, new media team, they call it then. Um, so I came across this book and um, it would interest you to know that um, I joined, when I joined the organization, uh, I think uh, they, they had barely, barely 10,000 followers across board. You know, but in three years, we were able to grow, of course, um, alongside the amazing team that uh, worked with me, you know, grew the organization's following to over 500,000 um, following, and then also got, the, got, got all the accounts verified, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, you know, I, I left about two years ago to found um, AfriLearn, which is um, uh, what I do fully now, uh, it's an education technology company. That is um, um, on a mission to deliver world class um, affordable education for Africans anywhere, leveraging technology, you know, and um, that's coming on pretty awesome. awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, alongside my friend, you know, so um, yeah, so, so I practically read a book, it opened my eyes. So, uh, it's, it changed the way I saw media, basically, you know, uh, and it also helped me to see the, the, critical parts that video actually would play you know in the future of um, social media so um one of the things that i did was uh, this time was the first church um seriously to um start leveraging disruptive video content you know um, so one of the questions i asked the team then was what's the unique selling proposition of um they start you know and what we found was the word you know because some of them is a powerful powerful speaker um so what we then did was okay so we took the word and i caught 
snippets of it every single day and deploy it across board, you know. And then the thing, and then the content basically took a different turn. We started getting crazy engagement, you know. So till date, even um after I left, um the church uh, still does an amazing, amazing uh, work online um, to the point where. We also got an award, you know, uh, from one of the most respected um, branding uh, companies in Nigeria. Yeah. So, so nice. Jeremy's was amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. I love the story. That's good. I'm glad it helped. I'm really glad it helped. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So, so let's talk about the future projects. Um, what's, um, um, what's the book about, basically? Yeah, the Focus Project, it's just the not-so-simple art of doing less better. And so with this pandemic, we actually launched the book a couple months early, which is unheard of in the publishing world. But a lot of people reached out, readers, and said, hey, my friend is okay physically. They don't have the virus, but they're mentally yeah. struggling. They don't know where to focus. Their home's working from home. They have to now order everything online. And so it's been a crazy ride for the world. Uh, as my daughters say, we're all in this together, like high school musical, but yeah. so we, we moved the book forward. It's essentially how to focus in this unfocused world. How do I not have every day be so busy and crazy and think big? So I always say, don't think busy. I don't want you to ever say I'm busy. I want you to say I'm, I'm doing big things. And when someone asks yeah. you how you're doing, you're like, oh, it's busy. No, it's great. I'm working on some big stuff. And so that's what the whole book's about. It's how to focus in this unfocused world. Mm, it's amazing. 2020, okay. so it's all about the vision, the glasses, so it all comes together. It's crazy. I didn't even realize it. It's funny. We did the book, and then the publisher said, well, we should take advantage of your glasses because of focus. Like, I didn't even think about that. And then they go, you know, it's 2020, 2020 vision. I go, oh, man, it's all coming together. Let's do it. Amazing, amazing. So, 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 how can people maintain focus on what really matters during these challenging times? Exactly, it's trying to focus on the important, not the immediate. And so, whether I was speaking at Google, at Facebook, whether it's at Godiva Chocolates, whether it was at Levi Strauss, it didn't matter. Whether I was talking to a school teacher or whether I was talking to a stay-at-home dad, everyone had the same core challenge that. It's not yeah. that we have a lack of time or a lack of resources. We think that. I thought that. But it's, we just have a lack of priority. So really, mm. it's about, it's called a project because I took all the science and then married it with what I call street science. So me, like a, a guinea pig. So I go, this says this, this will help me sleep better, this food, but does it? It says this food's going to help me focus better, but does it? It says that if I write down one thing per day, in the morning that I should be focused on, that that'll help me achieve big things, but does it? And so I took all this research and merged it with my own personal attempt at this stuff, and I'd give myself a grade each month. So my hope is that it's a lot of key takeaways for folks just to realize, okay, this is how I focus on what matters, to lead to fulfillment. So yeah. not necessarily lead to success, but lead to me feeling fulfilled. And when you're fulfilled, there's obviously, usually there's success that comes with it. Mm, amazing, amazing, amazing. Okay, so so what's, I mean, uh, I'm sure a lot of people want to know, um, because actually the major reason why uh, we do the IZ series is basically to transform consumers into producers, you know, to raise disruptors, you know, because uh, I personally realized that um, my life, practically changed the day I realized that I can produce um, products that people, other people would use, you know, and it is actually very possible for any single, anybody right. to do across board, you know. So, um, as, as, a, as a, well, I mean, one renowned author, what's, what's uh, can you take us through your normal daily routine? You know, what's an average day like for you, basically? Yeah, average day is I get up usually around 6.30. Sometimes if it's a good day, I get up at 6. I like to get up early before the day, the noise starts to creep in. Um, yeah. And then I usually do the big thing, that one thing. So I, I kind of meditate for 10 minutes, just like, all right, what's the day look like? What's my intention? What am I grateful for? And I usually do that in the bed. So it's just like, all right, I'm waking up. All right, what's my main intention? Reset, yeah. recenter, and then 
be grateful for something. So one thing, am I grateful for my kids? Am I grateful just that it's the rains out there today or the sun, whatever it might be? Because the research shows if you're grateful, it actually leads to success and happiness and fulfillment. Then yeah. from there, what I do is I go and figure out, if I haven't written it down the night before, I make sure I write down, here's the one thing that I need to do that makes everything else either easier or unnecessary. And I don't answer yeah. email. I don't do the easy stuff first. I attack that one thing that's probably the hardest thing before my brain gets tired because it's a real thing. Your brain, like your iPhone, throughout the day, it starts to drain the battery. So I got to use yeah. my brain power when it's at its highest. And that's usually about an hour after you normally wake up. It's different for everybody, but most of us, it's an hour after you normally would naturally get up. And so I don't want to waste that power hour. That's my power hour. I say 30 minutes, it usually goes in an hour, but I just, for, for sure, I want to make sure just 30 minutes I'm going to attack that. So it might be, if I'm in the process of writing a book, I have to write those, those pages. Right now, I'm not in the process of writing, so it varies day to day. But it's really just attacking that one thing. And then from there, the night before, throughout the week, every day I look at my schedule for a week, two weeks, three weeks. So I'm not surprised. Because I want to, mm. I call it cowboy scheduling. It's something you'll read in the book. We've got to schedule like cowgirls and cowboys, which means fence off specific time for yourself. And so you've got to fence it off for your big projects. And then try to keep a lot of wide open spaces. Like Bill Gates learned that from Warren Buffett. So part of what we, we learned during the process was that Warren Buffett, if you look at his calendar, it's a piece, it's a paper calendar. And then Bill Gates is kind of laughing at it going, there's like three things in here for the month. And Warren goes, <laughs> yeah. that's right. You know, cause I'm focused. And Bill mm. Gates goes, Oh my gosh, I always thought I need to have my calendar completely full to be an effective CEO. When it's in most cases, it's the exact opposite. Mm. Wow, that's that's very profound. That's very profound. You know, um, I'm talking about Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. Um, for you personally, who has had the greatest um, impact on your career so far? Yeah, I mean, my parents first and foremost, but then I was also fortunate to play basketball at Michigan State University. And so the coach there is Coach Tom Izzo. He's a Hall of Fame coach, which means he's one of the best coaches at the university level. Um, awesome. And so it just he's all about grit and grind. And yeah. so it's all about just that grinder. Keep at it. Keep in the process. Mm. And so he's had the biggest impact. Just like if you can dream it, like as Walt Disney says, you can do it. But if it was easy – it already be done. And so Absolutely. when you're in that grind, you got to remind yourself, if it was easy, it would already be done. And yeah. so yeah. you, you got to just keep at the process. And he's taught me the most about that. Just sticking with it. Awesome. Awesome. So who, who would you say, I mean, um, what, would, what would you say has been your, the biggest achievements of your career life so far that you're most yeah, I mean, proud of? I mean, most proud always. I'm always trying to live up. My daughters gave me a world's greatest dad coffee mug. <laughs> so, they're, they're still little. They're right here running around, but they're, uh, they're still young. But I'm still trying to live up to that coffee mug. So I've got it front and center on my desk and always reminds me that's what life's all about. And so that's the key. But um, in terms of career, the biggest thing is I just want to empower people to their best life so that they can inspire others to do the same thing. And for your listeners, you should always write that sentence out, to blank, so that. So, that, so you're focused on what your whole goal in life is. So it's like to blank, so mine is to empower people to their best life, and then so that they can inspire others to do the same. So we've got this crazy laughable goal at Equal Man Studios that we want to reach 7 billion people by the year 2030. Yeah. And we've yeah. reached... We've reached 50 million, over 50 million. We're reaching more today. So thanks for allowing us to do that. And so yeah. that's the thing we're most proud of is that we've touched some lives that hopefully made them better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, so what's, the, what's the best business um, or career advice you ever received so far? The best career advice I ever received was just, if you want to do it, do it. Like success is a choice. Mm. And so don't, 
don't wait for it. Do it. Tomorrow's never going to come. So a lot of us, you know, it's called the present because it's a gift, but a lot of us forget to unwrap it. And people hear that, like, follow my passion. They get sick of hearing that because they got to pay their bills. And yeah. it's so true, though. And this is what I tell people. Look, a lot of you don't even know what your passion is. That's not unusual. There's a lot of people who don't know what their passion is. So at the, yeah. whether you're 18 or whether you're 80. And so at the end of each day, write down what made you the happiest and why. And over a couple of weeks, you're going to see that pattern. And that pattern is going to show you what your passion is. And so once you know that passion, yeah. it doesn't mean you have to quit your job right away. What it means is if you want it bad enough, then you can do yeah. it. You keep your day job and just try to figure it out. So for me, what does that mean? So I didn't quit right away to start speaking on stage. I would take a vacation day to fly to Buenos Aires, speak, yeah. take the red eye back, land, and go in yeah. the office. And I was obviously pretty tired doing that. I had a team that reported to me. But um, that's what you have to do sometimes in the short term. And then you go through these seasons and then yeah. you, you make it happen and then you, you keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so if, um, Eric, if, if you were going to, um, if you were to go into a different business right now, like start something from scratch, um, what's that one untapped, you know, powerful, lucrative business opportunity in the world right now that you would take advantage of if you were to start something now? Gosh, if I were to start something right now, I mean, there's such a world of opportunity that we're looking at. I could rattle off a ton of stuff, but it would be anything that does with artificial intelligence that makes your life easier. Mm. Anything that makes life easier. And okay. A lot of that means that artificial intelligence. I mentioned it earlier for people that are already on here, that that means yeah. Alexa, reorder my groceries and apply the coupon. Yeah. Alexa, book my ticket or Google Home. It doesn't matter. Google Home, book my flight Yeah. on my preferred airline at the best cost, the best time between these dates. And so yeah. I'm not doing any of that research. So if you can build that trust, if you can yeah. provide that value, it gives. That's what social economics is all about. Is like, how can I give you back time? How can I give you your most precious commodity? Every yeah. human being, the, the most valuable thing in the world. It's not oil. It's not money. It's time. And so, if I can create something, and a lot of it might be artificial intelligence, it doesn't matter how you yeah. do it. It's just how do I yeah. give you time so that you can spend more time with your loved ones? That's it. People want to spend more time with their hobbies and their loved ones. And so yeah. um, always try to solve for that and you will win. And now with artificial intelligence, you can see right away what that solve is because you can see the frustration points that people have. And those aren't, those aren't hard to detect. What's hard is producing something that's so easy to use and so valuable that that's hard. Simple is hard. As Steve Jobs said, simple is hard. Mm. All right. Amazing. Okay. So um, in, in, in closing, basically, um, how do you unwind? I mean, you, you've written um, um, bestsellers, you speak around the world, you know, you live pretty much uh, a serious life to a large extent, you know, you change, you're changing lives. But then, um, how how do you unwind? Um, do you relax at all? And um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you need you need to relax. Um, there are some people that I just don't know when they sleep, and so if you're one of those point zero five percent that can do that, congratulations. But as we found out from our research, <laughs> that sleep's actually a leadership tool. And so, first wow. and foremost, for your viewers, because I want to make sure they know this is that each and every day, like people go, how do you stay so motivated? And I go, well, to be honest, on a one out of 10, 10 being the highest, throughout the day, I'm going to hit like two points, especially during this pandemic. And I, yeah. what I do is I don't allow myself to stay there. And how do I avoid staying there is I, I always go, I look down at my two feet and go, wow, I'm so happy that I have two feet. And now I have two choices looking at my two feet. I can be enthusiastic or I can be very enthusiastic. Yeah. And so when yeah. I start to get to that low level, I make sure I don't stay there. And gratitude is the best way to get out of there. Now, for me to unwind, yeah. I, do, I do love following my former coach, Michigan State basketball. He's been there now 35 years. So I always, that's a good outlet, mindless, just kind of follow what they're doing. 
Um, I love to read both fiction and nonfiction. And fantasy football, it's the season for fantasy football. And so that's just mindlessness that lets me take my brain and just kind of give it a little rest for a couple hours. Awesome. Wow. I, I find um, this statement of yours very profound. Man, sleep is a leadership tool. Um, um, that's going to stay with me for a long time. Sleep is a leadership tool. Awesome. 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 So what's your favorite social media platform um, and why? Oh, man. That's like choosing your favorite kid. I will say that the one I'm most interested in, the two that I'm interested in right now are TikTok and and LinkedIn because they still have major organic reach, so free reach. So those are the two that, that intrigue me the most right now because they still have a lot of organic reach. Sorry, which and which? I, I didn't get the name. Uh, yeah, TikTok and LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. LinkedIn, I find LinkedIn very amazing, actually. Uh, very, very amazing. Okay. So I think we have um, we have um, very few minutes left. Uh, so in closing, um, um, how can we get your new book? And what do you have to say to um, um, that Afri young African out there who is watching these or who would watch these, who someday wants to be wants to write bestseller books like um, Eric? You know, what would you say to that person, basically? Yeah, number one. It's just have fun and help people. Just always remember, have fun and help people. And always ask, how can I provide value? And so when you go to write a book or you go to start a company, just always start with that end in mind. That, that end being you're going to put a smile on that customer's face or that reader's face. And so you've yeah. always got to start with the end in mind and work your way back. And that'll always keep you going. Um, and success is a choice. So with all these digital tools out there, it's a beautiful world. Before, if you wanted to write a book, you had to get a publisher. You don't have to do that anymore. You could go direct on Amazon, KDP, or whatever your favorite tool of choice is. You can go direct to your fan base. And you probably start off with a fan base of one, your mom or your dad. And everyone starts there. And so yeah. just start there. Follow what you love to do. Um, and just just keep at it. You know, you're going to have to pay the bills, but when you have the time, do that little side hustle and write that book, write that screenplay, design that dress, whatever it is you want to do. And then over time, if that pulls at you enough, if that's your passion, then at some point you're going to go all the way in on it. Wow. Thank you so much, um, Eric. Um, it's been uh, a profound time with you. Would you consider coming to Nigeria anytime soon? What would, what would be the condition to bring you to Nigeria? Uh, first of all, I'm not flying anywhere right now, but first it would be awesome if people could start flying again because of the pandemic. But yeah, let's make it happen. I'd love to get there. It's been on the bucket list. Um, and so I want to make that happen for sure. It'd be awesome to, to hug it out in person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, if we were to bring you in uh, for a major session with um, thousands of youths, um, is it something you would consider? If, always. If can... I'm always like, let's go for it. Let's do it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay. I can always speak with you um, about that um, and your team. Um, okay, amazing, amazing. All right, guys, it's been an amazing time with uh, Eric. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and, of course, for those of you that watch on YouTube and on Top Niger, uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, whatever you do, do not forget uh, one of the most profound things um, Eric has said tonight. Um, sleep is a powerful leadership tool. Uh, I took that away. Then also um, made mention of the fact that uh, your goal in life should not be to be successful, but to be valuable because success always follows value. You know, the way to actually... Um, earn more is to learn more. When you learn more, you are more valuable and you become a magnet, literally attracting value to yourself. So once again, thank you very much for this amazing time. Thank you so much, Eric, for doing this. I really appreciate it. It means a lot. Thank All you, right. Isaac. So, thank you for lending me your time today. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. My regards to the um, Corman, e -Corman team, uh, your entire team. You know, Have an amazing rest of the day. You too. All right, guys. Thank you. Yeah, see you next week. Cheers.